Nightwood by Juna Barnes is considered one of the hardest books in the English language, and so to prove that I deserve to call myself an extreme reader, as I always have, I decided to read it, and never has my literary manhood been more affirmed. Through a daring feat of strength and mind, I summited an 180-page book over the course of a year, and now that success is mine, I'm pausing to reflect, something I do frequently with great ease. What's the point of reading a book just because it's hard? Glory. And respect, I suppose. Specifically from the women that I plan to tell. My social standing really skyrocketed after I read Infinite Jest, so I anticipate a similar uptick now that I've read Nightwood. What should I read next? Another magnum opus, I suppose. Why? Well, if you're really logical and rational about the whole thing, the choice shouldn't be hard at all. Now, don't get me wrong. Nightwood is about things and stuff. But the point is that it's hard, and I read it, and that probably says a lot about me and who I am as a person. Who am I? What do you mean? It's me. I could tell you everything about myself. What else is there to me? What else would there be? Nonsense, that's what, and gibberish practically. We must have a strict sense of integrity, coherence, and scientific rigor to our literature. For if even one delusion made it onto the printed page, Western civilization as we know it would crumble before our eyes. But you don't have to worry. I've taken up the call of the word to stand as a pillar neath the weary feet of lady literature so that our society, built by brave, smart, handsome individuals, not unlike myself, doesn't collapse out of the sunny paradise of knowledge and truth into the broad, chaotic nonsense of the night. Taken to reflecting again. And I think it's a shame that Nightwood is known just for being difficult, because that distracts from how amazing the writing is, and what the writing is actually about. It makes it sound like Juna Barnes was just hanging out, trying to write this contrived puzzle so that we could try to understand it and twist our mustaches and say, it's the notes she's not playing. And while I usually say it's the notes they're not playing sarcastically to describe dry, boring books that don't really grab me as a reader, in Nightwood's case, there's actually a fair amount going on outside of the words, if that makes sense. So maybe in this case, it is actually fair to say it's the notes she's not playing, but we'll talk more about that in a moment. Because the notes she is playing are vivid and evocative. It's honestly some of the best writing that I've ever read, and I've read, like, a lot of books. As I was reading Nightwood, I tried to write down some of my favorite sections, but I found that I was just transcribing the book into my notes. I came to find that on every single page there were beautiful descriptions that demonstrated her mastery of the art of writing, but also that offered fresh and insightful takes on the humanity of her characters. It all leads to a profound statement about perception and human relationships, which is evoked in her scenes for one, but then also in her poetic prose, elaborate metaphors, and still somehow simple and contained plot. You'll enjoy Nightwood if you like books about important statesmen and noblemen discussing propriety and civilization. The book begins with a distinguished man named Felix, aka the Baron. The Baron is really into history, people of rank, and genuflecting. But while he's interested in all the niceties of high society, he gets involved with a group of circus performers. My word! And one night he goes to a party with them where he's supposed to meet an important count. Rather than meeting the count, he meets a doctor an extremely talkative queer abortionist. And then some girl named Nora comes over and interrupts them and dares question these men. She asks, are you both saying what you really mean or are you just talking? Oh. The doctor gives a witty retort which makes Felix the Baron do something which is rather gauche. I hesitate even to say it. He laughs. Don't worry though, Felix apologizes and the Count shows up and kicks everybody out. Later, when Felix and the doctor are at a cafe, they are informed that a woman has fainted, a damsel in distress named Robin. After she is revived, Felix looks into her eyes, and then she closes her eyes, but he still sees her eyes somehow. Don't think about it too hard. And he sees her eyes, long unqualified range in the iris of wild beasts who have not tamed the focus down to meet the human eye. Notice that the range in which her eyes see is unqualified. 
meaning without reservation or limitation, and their focus is untamed like a wild beast. This is a pretty big contrast from Felix, who is so reserved and tamed that he apologizes after laughing. So naturally, he marries her as any red-blooded man would when seeing a fainted woman who reminds him of an animal. They have a kid, yada yada. Can we get back to the men talking, please? So does Felix go on to write some important treatise on history and society? Maybe we get a sequence of him organizing his many trophies and ribbons. But what if I told you that starting the book with Felix was a trick? And the worst part, he's not actually a baron. Ah! Felix's father faked his entire lineage and even got a painting of actors that are supposed to be his noble ancestors. And Robin's introduction as a damsel in distress is a trick as well, and so is introducing Nora so subtly at the party. Robin and Nora turn out to be the two main characters in Nightwood. So it's all a trick. It's all a trick. It's all a trick in a game. There are several reasons why Juna Barnes might have done this. One reading is that it represents the marginalization of women in society by literally marginalizing her female characters in the narrative. Because for a book that's supposed to be about a love triangle between three women, a lot of the book concerns Felix and the Doctor's long speeches. So she subverts her expectations, offering us a book that appears to be about men and historical lineage when the book is actually about women. But even though the focus shifts away from Felix toward the middle of the book, the Doctor still gets a lot of stage time and his long speeches make up a large portion of the book. I think that by focusing on the women only tangentially, she evokes a central theme and partial namesake of the book, the night. So what is the night? That's really easy. Um, when the sun is up, that's the day, and then when the sun goes down, that's the night. It's actually way more complicated than that. Think of the phrase to shed light on something or to illuminate. Both of these mean to clarify or to make something known both of which imply to put something into words. So if these traditional notions of knowing something and putting them into words concern light, then the night would be everything that we can't know or cannot put into words, or the ineffable. So if the night is the ineffable, then Juna Barnes set out on a pretty difficult task of evoking things that cannot be put into words in a book, which is made out of words, if you didn't know. But by dedicating so many words to men and the doctor's wordy speeches, she associates the men in the narrative with that which can be known through words, and the women with the ineffable, evoking and subverting the notion of men as the rational gender who rely on facts and logic, and the women as the irrational gender who are emotional and laugh without apologizing. I admit that this reading is a little broad because Robin becomes more heavily associated with the knight than the other women in the narrative, and the doctor knows a lot about the knight, and he's not nearly as stiff or traditional as Felix is. But it was a brilliant move on Juna Barnes's part to have the doctor to be the one to put the ineffable into words in his long speeches. Also, just to clarify, even though the doctor's gender identity is investigated in the book, it's not explicitly labeled. Anne Nightwood was published in 1937, well before we had a much more codified understanding of different gender identities. And Juna Barnes refers to him with male pronouns. That's why I refer to him as a he, while saying that he was also queer and perhaps gender fluid. And a lot of the book ends up being about the world that exists beyond words and beyond labels, so I just wanted to throw that out there. But it's pertinent that the Doctor is our wordy access to the things that can't be put into words. Felix, who we can safely say is a cishet man, would probably just tell you that the knight or the ineffable is just nonsense or irrationality, and the women in the narrative don't feel the need to give long speeches. So as the doctor straddles the boundary between genders, he also straddles the boundary between what can be put into words and what is the night. I talk too much because I have been made so miserable by what you are keeping hushed. So if the night speaks to a kind of lack of understanding or a lack of information, then she's upstaging the women with the wordy speeches from the doctor and words about Felix. So a way to look at this is that the dynamics of the women somehow go on outside of the male gaze or the rationalist gaze or the gaze that could reduce their experience to words. Another way to think about this is through Buddhist philosophy. And as a side note, if you're ever struggling with Western philosophy's attempt to describe the limits of understanding or the things that can't be known, Buddhist philosophy and Eastern philosophies often present it in a much more digestible way. For example, you might have heard of the first noble truth in Buddhism, to live is to suffer. But this idea comes from a Sanskrit word, dukkha, 
which is actually way more complex than suffering. It's actually that there's a brokenness or an absence to everything, to you and to every phenomenon in the universe. This obviously leads to suffering, but it isn't exactly just suffering. As a brief Buddhist tangent, one of my favorite parables describes this very well. So there's this guy who's got a cup, and it's an old heirloom, it's extremely fancy, and it's been passed down through the generations in his family, and his son, who's a rowdy ingrate, speaking of, accidentally knocks the cup off the table and shatters it into a million pieces. So the guy, knowing that he can't banish his son from the family, comes up with some wise shit to make his son feel better. He says, he says, the cup was already broken. So I could go into great detail to describe what this means and its relation to epistemology and absence, but the short version is that it's just a fucking cup. You can't really rely on it to make you happy because it's just another fleeting phenomenon in our experience. And as the greatest poet of our time, Joanna Newsom, says, Life is thundering blissful toward death in a stampede. And that goes for fancy cups, too. I'll talk in greater detail about the night in a bit, but first I want to show you how amazing Juna Barnes's writing is, and what she does on just a few pages. So this is page 57 and 58 in my edition. And just to reiterate, there is writing this beautiful on every single page in this book. Whenever she was met at the opera, at a play, sitting alone and apart, the program face down on her knee, one would discover in her eyes, large, protruding and clear, that mirrorless look of polished metals which report not so much the object as the movement of the object, as the surface of a gun's barrel reflecting a scene will add to the image the portent of its construction. So her eyes contracted and fortified the play before her in her own unconscious terms. One sensed in the way she held her head that her ears were recording Wagner or Scarlatti, Chopin, Palestrina, or the lighter songs of the Viennese school in a smaller but more intense orchestration. Here, Juna Barnes gives an excellent take on the nature of perception. Rather than describing that Nora has a scientific rationalist access to the world, she describes that Nora's eyes reflect like metal that report not so much the object that they see. And further, her eyes contract and fortify the play that she's watching, just like the rounded surface of a gun's barrel will warp the image that's reflected in it. And lastly, she writes that one gets the sense that when she's listening to Wagner or Chopin, etc., she's changing the orchestration in her head. This is an awesome way to describe that the way that we perceive things is mitigated by our perceptual faculties. So she isn't seeing an actual play or hearing the actual music as it really is, but rather a version of it that's translated through her perception. This is almost perfectly in line with Kant's idea of correlationism, that we don't have access to the actual world as it is, the world that we experience is actually the correlate of the world and our perception of it. On page 59, she lays this out in a vivid image. The world and its history were to Nora like a ship in a bottle. She herself was outside and unidentified. A ship in a bottle is obviously a constructed object that's defined by the fact that it's contained. Likewise, when we talk about facts or the world as it can be known in words, it is an attempt to bottle or to possess the world to a certain extent. And notice that Nora herself is outside and unidentified. So even though she perceives a mitigated version of the world, it appears that she's unaware of this process, thinking she sees the world as it really is. Which I think is supported by the line on page 56, which says, By temperament, Nora was an early Christian. She believed in the word. The obvious connotation of the word here would be the word of God. But given Nightwood's preoccupation with perception and the way that things can be described in words, I think that this shows that Nora puts faith in the world as it can be described in words. Now, this doesn't mean that she's like Felix exactly, who bows down to history and lineage. Felix looks at himself as an inheritor of the fixed nobility of the past, the Baron. Whereas Nora looks at the fixity of the world and history as an object in front of her of which she is not a part. To reiterate, she is outside of the bottle and unidentified. And Juna Barnes also builds this beautiful image of Nora as like a singularity perpetually falling in space, which I read as almost with like anime action lines behind her, which is pretty psychedelic for a book released in 1937. So since Nora is more or less convinced that she can know the world, 
even though she is some singularity outside of it, she is befuddled over Robin, who both literally and figuratively disappears into the night throughout the narrative, which I'll touch on more later. But while we're talking about perception, I wanted to call attention to the other ways that Nightwood investigates the idea that words present themselves as tools for understanding the world and how they prove to be insufficient. So on my first read-through, one of the main things that struck me was the attention that Nightwood gives to binaries, contrasts, and paradoxical descriptions. I didn't have time to find them all, but for example, there's the description, moves toward him in recoil. Reproach as a reminder of love. The accumulated and the single. Those long remembered can alone claim to be long forgotten. Listening with unbecoming loquacity. Docile with toil. Ferocious with dignity. Savage and refined. Undocumented record of time. Beauty and deformity. By giving us these contrasting descriptions in the same breath, she calls attention to the way that seeming opposites can define each other. Dissolving the implication that concepts can accurately portray the things that they refer to. This is something that I think is most clearly described in the Tao Te Ching, which describes, for example, how big and small define each other. So rather than thinking of big and small as opposites with clear boundaries, pairing them as mutually defining each other shows that they're more features of our perception or language rather than inherent features of the world. It's in this way that Nightwood gives me the feeling that it's playing my head like an instrument. Its focus on perceptions and the way that we understand things ends up carrying the narrative momentum more than the scenic action or the plot points. So just to review, we open with a story that seems to be about a man and his historical lineage only to get a story about women and a deconstruction of the way that words try to describe the world. The way that Juna Barnes supports this theme is manifold, but the clearest example is with Robin's disappearance into the night and her being characterized as a somnambulist, which means a sleepwalker. After all, Robin is introduced as having fainted, as though she were so weary of the world as it can be known or described that she disappears into the unknowable world of unconscious sleep. On page 94, the doctor describes how we betray our lovers by falling asleep, which shows that the night is not just a philosophical concept. It actually has an effect on human relationships. The night is also the mysterious place that your lover disappears to when they go to sleep, or the unknown things that they do when you're not around. The night is the part of the person who you love that you'll never have access to, the part of them that is fundamentally removed from you. So if you're like Nora, this can come across as a pretty big bummer. You want to know your lover entirely, but Nightwood shows us that realizing this want would be equivalent to possessing them or trying to own them like a pet. Confusingly enough, Nightwood also establishes that the night might include the beastly or animal parts of ourselves that we repress or pretend don't exist as we carry on being dignified human beings. And I don't really have enough time to describe this in its entirety, but suffice it to say for now, that Nightwood dismantles the binary between animals and humans. So on page 96, Nora asks, well, how do you live then? If there's an absence at the center of everything, of every concept of you and the people you love, then doesn't that mean that everything is meaningless? Isn't this nihilism? This touches on territory that I also discuss in my David Foster Wallace video about his take on what he saw as postmodern nihilism. Another very controversial figure, Jordan Peterson, levies a similar criticism against postmodernism. But the usual criticism of Jordan Peterson's criticism is that he simply doesn't understand postmodernism. I think it's interesting, though, that for David Foster Wallace, for all of the criticism that he receives, no one ever accuses him of misunderstanding postmodernism. And to be fair, if you read David Foster Wallace's writing, it's clear that he's familiar with Wittgenstein and other postmodern thinkers, whereas Jordan Peterson probably couldn't tell the difference between Wittgenstein and Derrida, which you'd better be able to do if you want to talk to me but I actually find that David Foster Wallace and Jordan Peterson have similar takes on postmodernism. And I'm not in love with the criticism that Jordan Peterson doesn't understand postmodernism, because the implication would be almost that if he'd read more Derrida, then he'd change his analysis. For one, Wittgenstein and Derrida are extremely complicated and at times incomprehensible. And you can twist your head into a pretzel pretty quickly trying to understand the way that they describe the limits of understanding while trying to account for in their writing those limits of understanding. And it amounts less to academic writing than to some sort of philosophical poetry. And two, these philosophers were just people who took it upon themselves to describe the way that 
the way that we describe things is broken. These ideas transcend any one thinker. And in Eastern philosophy, for example, they were writing about that thousands of years before the postmodern era. So did they understand postmodernism? They couldn't have. It didn't even exist yet. All of that is to say, I'm just not very satisfied with the criticism of Jordan Peterson's criticism that he didn't understand it. Like, oh, did Derrida say that? Show me the page. What books have you read? Because these ideas transcend any one thinker. And I think that you should be able to criticize these ideas non-academically, criticizing them as more of a cultural sensibility rather than an academic idea that's tied to any of these thinkers. And just to be clear, I'm not defending Jordan Peterson. I just think a better critique of his take on postmodernism isn't that he doesn't understand it, but just that he thinks it's bad. He's like Nora coming to the doctor for advice about his lover and the mysterious place that she always disappears to. And by his, of course, I mean hers for Nora, but I do like the idea of Jordan Peterson going to his queer best friend for relationship advice. Essentially, Peterson is like Nora, despairing that if all of these postmodern claims about the limits of knowledge and words and understanding are true, then that ushers in nihilism. But I think a passage on page 90 is an excellent response to Jordan Peterson's stance on postmodernism, but also a great response to Nora's despair over Robin. To think of the acorn, it is necessary to become the tree. And the tree of night is the hardest tree to mount, the dourest tree to scale the most difficult of branch, the most febrile to the touch, and sweats a resin and drips a pitch against the palm that computation has not gambled. Gurus, who I trust you know are Indian teachers, expect you to contemplate the acorn ten years at a stretch, and if in that time you are no wiser about the nut, you are not very bright, and that may be the only certainty with which you will come away, which is a postgraduate melancholy. It's almost as if Peterson thinks that in dismantling an acorn is just a moment in a process of turning into a tree, we've somehow stated that acorns don't exist. But to conclude this way is to prioritize the concept of an acorn over an actual acorn, or thinking that it's better to know what an acorn is by itself than to know it as a part of a process. A more happy postmodernism might look like prioritizing an acorn and the whole of which it is a part over a completely airtight definition of an acorn by itself. We can think of the death of Robin that Nora wishes for on 158 as a wish for the night to be over, for the light of knowledge to come in and illuminate everything, for the sad nihilism to go away. But lo, the night is not devoid of content, it's just the world undescribed. It's the lover who is not just a construct before you. It's raw reality unmitigated by words or perception. It's the spaces between what our definitions can describe. It's an assertion that the world cannot be summed up or owned through our attempt to understand it. So it's not that getting rid of the way that we understand the world gets rid of the world. If anything, our definitions get rid of the world because they try to reduce it to words. And they prioritize the understanding of something over the thing itself. So let's apply this to an idea that's relevant to Jordan Peterson's output. The categories of men and women. I think it's here where it's most obvious that Jordan Peterson does understand postmodernism. He just doesn't like it. Eroding the conceptual difference between men and women, or the gender binary, might seem like a threat if we prioritize defending our understanding of those concepts over what those concepts might refer to. It would seem like saying that our inability to sufficiently describe those or for individuals to fit in those categories would mean that those categories don't mean anything and everything is meaningless. A happier spin on this might be the way that we understand ourselves is not as important as who we are as individuals, and not who we are like the content of our character, but literally that an individual is more important than a description thereof. So when we do away with the traditional categories of man and woman or try to dissolve the gender binary, we shouldn't lament the time when those words and categories made us feel like we knew what those things were. We should celebrate what an individual is as we would experience them in a Buddhist meditative state, an entity of mysterious origins that we experience as only a moment in a process, and we shouldn't let their appearance to us or a description of them confuse us that they are anything less. Framed in this light, it shouldn't take long at all to see where Peterson's criticism of postmodernism falls flat. To criticize the abyss that emerges after we get rid of the way or criticize the way that we understand things is to fear the bliss of meditation or of wordless experience of awareness of the broader whole of the universe. It could be an answer to his obsession with conserving the ways of history and the past, which give him a sense of safety. But to try to conserve the past and to try to wish that fixity into the present is to ignore the night that exists in the present day. 
and to ignore everything that's on the cutting edge which is still up in the air. So to lament that the night is meaningless is almost to assert that there is a meaning that ought to exist and then to cry foul that it doesn't. So this is not to say that everything ends on a happy note. The part about the acorn is rather wise, but the doctor, who is our intermediary figure between the light of day and the dark of night, ends up drunk and ranting, showing the conceptual breakdown of words and the way that we try to use them to describe the world. And Nora gets what she really wants beneath everything. No, not her lover Robin, but a dog, something that she can know and possess. For a book that's as complex and mysterious as Nightwood, it would be silly to say that it has a moral. But I'm silly. So if we can take any moral from Nightwood, it would be that another person can never be fully defined or understood. And to try to do so would be to try to own them like a pet. So maybe in our relationships with others, in our relationship with the world at large, it's better to accept the night, that there's always an absence there or something that we cannot understand and see that day and night actually define each other. It isn't a call for nihilism or despair. Instead, we should abide in the twilight, the middle way between knowing and not knowing, between the day and the night.